Sunday, I spoke about the situation in Gaza with the world-renowned political dissident, linguist, author, MIT professor Noam Chomsky. He was speaking in Princeton at the 32nd anniversary of the Coalition of Peace Action. Uh, Noam Chomsky recently returned from his first visit to Gaza, which he entered from the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing as a member of an academic delegation attending a conference at Gaza's Islamic University. This is Noam Chomsky talking about his experience there. It's kind of amazing and uh, inspiring to see people managing somehow to survive and uh, uh, as essentially caged animals uh, subject to constant, uh, random, um, sadistic punishment uh, only to humiliate them, no pretext. Uh, they're, um, uh, I mean, Israel and the United States keep them alive, basically. They don't want them to starve to death. But uh, life is set up so that you can't have a dignified, decent life. In fact, one of the words you hear most often is dignity. They would like to have dignified lives. And the uh, standard Israeli position is they shouldn't raise their heads. And, uh, it, it's a pressure cooker. It could blow up. You know, people can't live like that forever. You, descri you described it in a piece you wrote as an open-air prison. It's an open-air prison as soon as you, you know, we've all been in jail for civil disobedience and so on. And the overwhelming feeling everyone gets is somebody else is in total control of you. There's an arbitrary authority who can control anything you do. Stand up, sit down, you know. Uh, find something to eat, you know, go to the bathroom, whatever it may be, they'll determine it. You can't do anything. And that's basically what it's like living there. I mean, you know, there's a, 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 a people find ways to adapt, but it's just a constant, uh, it's constant subjugation to an external force which has no purpose except to humiliate you. And of course, they have pretexts. Everybody has pretexts, but uh, they don't make any sense. This was the first time you were there, though you've written about this for decades. I've written about it forever, and uh, I've tried to get in a couple of times from the Israeli side, but it was always closed. So this is the first time I made it. We came through Egypt. And how hard was it to get through from Egypt? There was a lot of bureaucratic hassles. And uh, the border's still apparently controlled by the Mukhabarat, you know, the old security services, who were close to, I mean, they were under Mubarak, they are close to the Mossad, close to Israeli, uh, to the CIA, and, uh, and a lot of it, it's hard to know how much is just bureaucrats trying to make life difficult for you, and how much is planned harassment. I mean, for people like us, you know, it doesn't matter, so we wasted two days, but for the Gazans, it's no joke. I mean, any, you know, if you want to go through something like passport control, you sit for three hours while they doing pointless things. You know, that's just more humiliation. While you were there, the Freedom, another uh, Freedom Flotilla ship tried to get in through from Scandinavia. What yeah. was the response uh, on land? The Estelle, yeah, we had a... Uh, there's a lot of excitement. People like to, you know, obviously are very happy to know that somebody knows they're there and that people are actually willing to risk something because it's not a joke, you know, uh, to try to break through. And uh, we had a press conference at the port. And to my amazement, it was actually covered in uh, the most reactionary newspaper in Israel, Sheldon Adelson's newspaper, Israel Hayom. Look it up. He had a, they had a fair report of it, quoted the press conference, even had a clip of it. But for the people there, it's... Uh, it's just a sign you haven't forgotten us, you know. Maybe we'll get out somehow. And we're speaking for the first time after President Obama was just re-elected. Your thoughts? Well, there are two good things about it. One is the worst didn't happen, and it might have. The second is it's over. So we can put it behind us and get back to work. Exactly what you said today. I mean, the whole electoral extravaganza, in my view, ought to take maybe five minutes of a, the time of an activist because it's a farce. I mean, there's some differences. It's not a zero impact. You know? 
so you decide, okay, I'm going to deal with it this way, five minutes, finished, now I go back to what matters, and changing the circumstances so that you don't have to endure things like this every four years. Or and with something like Gaza, which you've covered, as you said, forever, um, what gives you hope? Well, it's the usual thing that you see everywhere, that you've seen everywhere a lot more than I have. But people's resilience. They just don't give up under the worst conditions, horrendous conditions. And people still, you know, fight for their rights and uh, don't just succumb. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lesson for people from the West. I mean, you know, we, uh, we talk about repression, but, uh, you know, that undetectable by comparison with what most people in the world face. And if they can struggle on under really harsh and brutal conditions, tells us we ought to be doing a lot more.